Matthew Carmichael Harris. Welcome to the show. How dare you? Uh, <laughs> trot out the middle name right right out of the gate. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to be here, Dan. <laughs> we'll see if that happiness sustains uh, under the um, withering barrage of questions. Uh, <laughs> let me just let me just set the table a little bit, provide a little context, um, tell a few stories. Uh, that came to mind as I was preparing for this interview. Uh, one is I have a clear memory of being in Central Park with you in 2008 or nine. <clears throat> we we're walking out of the park. We had just finished a family um, picnic, and I mentioned to you that I had I had tried meditation, and you winced with your full body and expressed profound concern for me. Uh, that concern quickly morphed into uh, your uh, default mode of mockery. I have here a gift that you gave to me at Christmas in 2009. Uh, this is an Eckhart Tolle calendar, which uh, I opened uh, the gift um, and uh, looked across the room and you had a... Um, shitting and grin uh, um, plastered on your face. Um, and then uh, a few other little stories. Um, uh, one time uh, you copied me on an email where one of your business colleagues noticed that I was on a, that I was on an, on a podcast talking about doing a startup. And he said, uh, the, your colleague said, oh, he sounds so much like you. And uh, he really clearly learned a lot from you. And you wrote, well, you'll tell if I've learned from him if I start saying things like "life is the dance" and "I am the dancer." Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one last little Matt Harris quip is uh, when I when I when Ten Percent Happier came out. By the way, you were a huge role in and and you played a huge role in making that book not suck. Um, and and I was getting offers after the book came out to uh, to do sequels, and you <clears throat> replied all to some chain suggesting that I do a a coffee table book on cats called 10% Tabier. So <laughs> <laughs> not my finest moment. <laughs> so I say all of this because it's enjoyable to torture you in public, but also to ask like what changed because here we are um, in 2024, 10 years after 10% Happier came out and you're really into this stuff now. I just want to, you, you wrote an essay um, called Field Notes on the Path, Year One. Um, and you you say, perhaps in my case, the path couldn't really begin until I had begun thinking about the second half of life. So I, I wonder if you could, after that big wind up, just say a little bit more about that. Yes, yeah, so well, the Eckhart Tolle thing in particular, I thought it was deeply ironic for the Power of Now guy to have like a, a calendar that allowed you to plan out your entire year in advance. <laughs> I think he, need, he needs to be a little, a little more thoughtful about his merch uh, from a brand perspective. But yeah, I think, I mean, I've wrestled with this question of what took me so long. You know, so I would frame it that way rather than the way I think about it isn't you know, why did I finally come to it, but rather what took me so long. And I say that a year or so into, uh, you know, quite deep exploration of these topics, um, that you've been so thoughtful on. Um, and I, I think it's worthy of a lot of introspection, honestly. I, and I, the way I put it in the essay is how I feel about it, which is that it was, um, that this kind of work requires a really intrinsic curiosity uh, that, you know, I had full intellectual knowledge of the utility of mindfulness meditation. I was not uncertain about that. I had seen its positive impact on you and um, obviously read all your books and even read some other books in the field and had conviction about the, you know, the thesis that, as you would put it, that this is sort of like brushing your teeth. It, this will be over time something that everyone agrees is just sort of good hygiene. And yet I just couldn't commit to daily meditation practice. Couldn't do it. Kept trying. Had my various kind of half-assed versions of it. Um, and so I am curious now still about why I couldn't. And all I can do to explain it is that, you know, right around my 50th birthday in December of, uh, of 2022, you know, I just started to have very different thoughts about what kind of life I wanted to live. 
And that led me to start, you know, reading additional books and talking to people and finally sitting down to meditate. And then it developed its own gravity from there. As you talk about like why you didn't get into it, a well, couple couple thoughts come to, to mind for me. Um, I'll do them one at a time. Uh, one is, you know, there's this hilarious line that you had when you were a little boy where mom and dad asked you, you know, they were trying to figure out like what was what was going on in your head. And one of them said to you, you're kind of like a closed book to us. And you said, eh, you know, I'm more like a pamphlet. <laughs> and uh, I, w- I wonder if there's any, 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 anything onward leading in that, in that joke. Yeah, I think the, you know, you and I, as you would know, of course, would get lunch, you know, <clears throat> round about once a month during this whole period where you were learning all these things and, and discovering these things. And you would share, you know, very generously what you were learning. And, you know, I wasn't a cynical bastard the entire time. So we actually yeah. had some, you know, constructive yeah. conversations. And I remember vividly pretty early on, you shared this metaphor of the waterfall of, you know, being behind the waterfall metaphorically where the water of course is your thoughts. And the, that image is elegant in that it, it very vividly shows the distinction between, you know, you, uh, between one and, and one's thoughts and also the way in which you can create that separation and, and, and reinforce it and get yourself out of the deluge, uh, and allow yourself some space to witness the deluge. And I remember thinking and even commenting to you like that, of course, you know, I think it really did come naturally to me, this idea that my thoughts aren't me. And that was is sort of part of my makeup. Um, I think it does go hand in hand with the the pamphlet idea of, you know, having a, a relatively straightforward and pragmatic, hopefully not to say simple, you know, kind of interior life, you know, relatively few noticeable demons. Um, and so I think part of the inertia against starting a really committed practice was this sense that I've kind of, I've got this. You know, this is, I can see why people would really, really need this, but the ideas resonate with me. And I feel like I kind of have a, a bit of a, a mindfulness that came right out of the box uh, with my particular mental makeup. So that's a story I was telling myself um, with some validity, but well short of, of the amount of credit I was giving myself. Well, actually, that's the story I was telling myself about you. Um, uh, well, just, I want to say, I mean, I know I started by, by listing all of your wise ass comments, but you were absolutely not a cynical bastard in the main. You said a bunch of funny shit that I think is just hilarious to repeat, but yeah, we, 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 you and I, and also a third friend, Josh, um, have had a standing lunch date once every four to six weeks for 18 years. So you were very involved in the five year process of, of the book. And I would say, you personally are among the three most important readers for me on everything I do. You, my wife, and our mutual friend, Zev Barrow, who's actually going to be, who actually ha- is taking part in this special and a uh, 10th anniversary series as well. Um, and so, so, you know, I, I definitely never got a hostility off of you at all. Um, and I, I, be- I basically told myself a story like I was always the troubled, pain in the ass kid. Um, you know, had to go see a psychiatrist when I was little and got arrested a bunch of times. And you were like, did well in school and were pretty placid all along. Um, so I, I really did believe that, yeah, you were not hostile to meditation, but maybe didn't really need it. Certainly not as much as I did. Um, which, which leads me to the other question I was going to ask you, which is, um, you know, I could imagine it would be hard to adopt something if you're you know, reasonably annoying older brother is trying to foist it upon you. And I'm sure in those early days, I was probably a little sweaty and evangelistic. And I know for Bianca, that turned her off and has created lasting resistance on her part. I don't know if if that played a role here for you. I've asked myself that question a ton. Uh, I I remain convinced that it didn't. You know, I, I think you were definitely not sweaty. I mean, you, the whole move you were making was a quite skeptical move and an exploration, not a, 
not about proselytizing and and certainly in in our interactions you weren't advocating for me to do it and you know so it wasn't that i don't believe i think in retrospect though i had a really elaborate set of defense mechanisms against these ideas hmm. um and it's ironic because when you frame it as a mental health move, in other words, I am more productive and I am, you know, as at least 10% happier and I, I, I'm making all these uh, improvements to my mindset and mentality and the quality of my life, et cetera. Again, I would readily acknowledge that. You'll note, you know, the teasing was largely around the spiritual aspects of it, which of course, you know, go hand in glove uh, le- less so in your work, but certainly in this in this field more generally, um, you know, you don't have to push very hard before somebody starts talking about, you know, what I would have called woo-woo dynamics, um, the metaphysics of of Buddhism and mindfulness, and and that was the part that I really had deeply entrenched resistance to. That that's what I was mocking and. So again, I, I would have acknowledged the mental health benefits and, and not considered myself the neediest candidate, uh, but I didn't feel a lot of resistance. And I did, in fact, meditate. And um, But where I really drew the line was at the, at the spiritual and metaphysical level. And what's ironic about that is that that's actually what's sort of keeping me so vigorously in the game now. You know, I mean, I feel... I've made huge progress in terms of the cognitive and and emotional benefits of mindfulness meditation. And I was surely not as evolved as I thought I was uh, by a long shot. But the really intriguing part for me, the the part that keeps me on the cushion more than I otherwise would be and and reading more and, and just very deeply engaged with the subject matter is this notion that, you know, once you recognize this awareness within yourself you it's not a big leap to think that perhaps the awareness within yourself is connected to the awareness within other and maybe all sentient beings and that's just a very different picture of how the world works than i was willing to engage with for the first 50 years of my life that is so interesting i mean there there's there are many interesting things you said there but the idea that what you were rebelling against is what actually is keeping you in the game right now. Um, that's a twist. You know, the rebellion, as you've noted eloquently, you know, part of it is the aesthetics of this set of folks. You know, it's easy to mock. You know, they, I mean, I, and I'm now incredibly sympathetic because when I sat down to try to write about some of these matters, and you'll hear me talk today, you already have, like, it's pretty hard to make your point clear without resorting to language that gets, you know, fuzzy at best and, and, and flowery and, and abuses the traditional semantics <laughs> that we're used to <laughs> around certain words. So I am now very sympathetic to Eckhart Tolle, who, by the way, I think is a proper genius at this point. Um, and, um, but yet that was a, a real turnoff, just the way these folks wrote, uh, so getting past that, but I really do think an openness to spirituality, which some people come by quite early in life and we think of them maybe as seekers or, or they inherit a spiritual tradition from their parents that they really buy into. But you and I didn't have a spiritual tradition, um, particularly, and our parents were atheists, really. And you and I both identify as Jewish culturally and ethnically and and. And yet there was certainly no sense of legitimacy to spirituality in our house growing up. No. And, you know, that appealed to me, the rational aspects of my brain sort of rebelled against it. So that's where the second half of life thing, I think, does come in. I'm not the first person to, um, in and around, you know, their 50s, start thinking that maybe there's more to this than what might appear. And... And so I think I'm just sort of the latest to have that turn of mind. <laughs> uh, I'm remembering mom. I'm, this is a perhaps apocryphal story, but I have this memory that mom explained 
in the same sentence that not only was Santa Claus not real, but also God wasn't real. Um, and uh, I don't know if she actually said that, but it's the type of thing she would have said. <laughs> you know, you and I were both bar mitzvahed. I remember dad had to come to the temple for some preparation class in advance of my bar mitzvah. And the rabbi was there who our rabbi looked like the Old Testament God, basically. <laughs> and uh, he was at the <laughs> front of the room and he was telling some Bible story. And then he, he paused and he asked if any of the kids or any of the dads wanted to talk about the story that he had just told. And, and our dad raised his hand and said, well, it's, you know, it's obviously a parable and he's trying to make X, Y, or Z point. And I was so embarrassed. I, I, I was like, dad, these people believe this stuff. You can't go around <laughs> calling it a parable. You know, these are religious folks. Um, so yeah, that was our house. You know, mom dropping truth bombs about no Santa, no God. And, uh, and then, you know, dad just knowing you know, they had no limit to their skepticism and, and atheism, which again, I, I respect, but it certainly left us without some kind of spiritual spine uh, to build from. Well, just as evidence of your spiritual commitment, when you ultimately did have your bar mitzvah, I recall when they brought you to the Torah to make your one wish, it was that you would become taller than your older brother. Um, so, I mean, that is a very holy moment. It was so that I could be a beacon among the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> among the Jews. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I, I will say that somebody was listening because you are taller than me. Just barely, but definitely <laughs> taller than me. Um, so, well, just, just I have a million questions, um, and I, I want to ask about sort of like what this first year has consisted of for you. But since you brought up what you're calling the spiritual... Um, and what you might have previously called the woo-woo. I'm just wondering, like, for me, first of all, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know exactly what you're referring to. But having read your essay, I think what you're referring to is the fact that um, you can look at your thoughts and realize that they aren't you. You can't, <laughs> you can't claim any ownership of them. You can also look at whatever it is that's aware of those thoughts, consciousness, awareness, and you can't really grab hold of that thing either. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, they say that the not finding is the finding. You know, you, you, you look for you, you look for some core nugget of mat between your ears, behind your eyes, and you won't find it. Um, that, which, which I, I think is what you're bracketing as spiritual, is to me at least not irrational. I mean, it could lead you to some non-evidence-based assertions like, oh, well, maybe this awareness is, as you said before, somehow shared and universal and non-local and whatever. And, and that's interesting conjecture. Um, but in and of itself, at least at the first blush, it doesn't seem, um, it's not like arguing in defense of wood nymphs and fairies. Correct. Yeah, I think the first, the observation, the waterfall observation that your thoughts are not you and that um, and that you uh, or there is something that is separate from your thoughts. I think that was, again, step one that I would have acknowledged. But I think the takeaway from a lot more time meditating and reading and thinking is that that which is behind the waterfall is impersonal. It doesn't feel like me either. You know, and at first I was sort of like, oh, so I'm not my thoughts. I am the witness. And then this, you know, these more non-dual ideas like you're referring to from Tibetan Buddhism. And by the way, correct me if, if any of this is, is subtly or, or massively off as uh, I'm still only a year into it. But the it's not me. That's not me either. Takeaway really kind of hit me right between the eyes and and then creates the possibility of this next move, which is to say, well, if that's not me, then, then maybe it is non-local. Maybe it is universal. Maybe there is a more global consciousness or awareness that a sliver of which is in me and a sliver of which is in you. And well, I have no evidence for that, uh, for sure. And I think maybe it's impossible to find evidence for that, but it's compelling 
and it has some explanatory power, I would say, uh, at least uh, subjectively in terms of my lived experience in a way that that reinforces its power. And so, you know, I'm, I'm self-conscious about maybe just wanting to believe this, right? I mean, I think the motivation for spiritually, uh, you know, spiritual awareness in the second half of life can come from the proximity to death and, and a felt need for something to comfort you in light of uh, your parents perhaps passing away or becoming infirm and the sense that you're next up for the Grim Reaper. Uh, I don't recognize that in myself. It really feels like curiosity and delight and playfulness and excitement. Um, but I remain, you know, open to various tricks. My ego, I'm sure, is playing on me. But I, I just want to say that it's a big part of my motivation is trying to understand better that question of connectivity between people. It's so interesting to contrast our trajectories here because you're you're diving right into the stuff that I didn't even bother with for years and still, you know, dance around warily sometimes. Like for me, it was all about the insight that you write about very well in your essay uh, that the ego is a slippery motherfucker that's constantly feeding up shitty ideas. And if you identify too strongly with these ideas, with these thoughts, then, you know, you're owned by them and you're, you know, down the primrose path pretty quickly. And I was just utterly ensorcelled by that idea, you know, that, that we, um, that I'd been, ha that I'd been having this internal conversation with myself since sentience, um, and that I was unaware of this conversation largely, and that it was leading me in, in, in directions that were, were deeply unhelpful. Y you've, You've gone to this next level of, okay, well, <laughs> what is knowing uh, th this conversation in the first place and what's going on with that? And you said it hit you right between the eyes. And I'm, so I'm wondering, like, what, what about it, uh, beyond being intellectually interesting, keeps you coming back? Well, I should say, like, if I've, if I've gotten there faster, if, uh, it's because I, you know, stand on the shoulders of a very small giant. Which is which is you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it, I think the I sort of again I really did have the advantage of deeply understanding that first move uh, from you know fifteen years of of dialogue with you and the benefit of your book. So I again I I took it as a given this idea of separating from those thoughts of, of not being lost in thought and the mechanic of meditation as a way to help you um, avoid that trap of being lost in thought. And so that wasn't fascinating. Um, it was the spiritual stuff that, that fascinated me. And that second move was part of that, which is the, you know, moving beyond just the mental health benefits to this, concept of awareness and consciousness as a thing, again, whether it's local or universal, really thinking about that, that second question of, okay, so we're not our thoughts. Well, what are we then? Which I, I didn't engage with until, um, until I turned 50. Um, and that, that, that was what put me on a more intense path for sure. And being able to, to meditate, being able to, in meditation, as I lengthened from five minutes to 20 minutes at a stretch, being able to develop a closer relationship with that witness capability or that consciousness and awareness, um, you know, it, it just grew more and more intriguing. And um, and there are, are great writings on this topic. Uh, and, and I was attracted to some of those minds as well. Uh, and I, and I, I do sometimes think I have a, a, a too heady approach to all this where I'm much more likely to read the thinkers and, and, um, and there's no substitute in my mind and my experience for just meditating. <laughs> uh, but the ideas were and are very compelling to me. Is part of what is compelling, um, 
this idea of, you know, now we're getting firmly into the realm of Eckhart Tolle's calendar, but um, uh, this idea of interconnection that, that this, this um, mysterious awareness that's in all of us, you know, that the, 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 the brute fact that the lights are on in the first place, that we can be aware of anything at all, that the idea that, that since it's so mysterious, perhaps it is connecting us to some whole, um, and that, that is a, a, an ancient venerable spiritual notion that, that we are, that is, there's some unity in there perhaps, um, is that somehow comforting to you on a visceral level, but beneath the the intellectual curiosity? Well, I, I I am intellectually honest enough to acknowledge that it has to be. You know, <clears throat> human beings are uh, are weak in many ways, wildly strong in others, but but one of those we are susceptible to fear and and being scared of notions of separateness and feeling alone and, and all these vulnerabilities that we have. And so I think you'd have to acknowledge if you were being quite clinical about it, that this, you know, perennial philosophy, this, this idea that's been around for a long time, that consciousness is part of a unified whole. Well, it it addresses our vulnerability. So it's a little pat, (laughs) You know, you'd have to at least suspect that there was something developed uh, to make people feel better. And so I think, therefore, you have to turn that lens on yourself and say, like, well, is the appeal of that idea simply to make me feel better? And I'm fine with that hypothesis. I'd say my lived experience is a little different, which is just that it feels true to me. I don't really have a better way to say it than that. <laughs> but just having spent a lot of time on this topic, on the cushion and off, it rings true. It feels right. So um, that could easily be simply because I deeply desire that feeling of connection and unity and it's going to make me feel better to feel connected versus feeling separate. I get that, but I, that is not how it feels. It does not feel like a device. It feels like a truth that I've discovered. And I don't see any harm in going with that version of the theory. It feels true to me too. And I have no, I have no evidence for it. No, I mean, I can't prove it. I mean, I kind of sometimes think about us as like tornadoes, you know, like uh, a a, 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 a lot of wind comes into the landscape and it pulls up lots of stuff from the earth, dust and, you know, houses and park benches or whatever, just atoms in various formations. And it spins and spins and spins. And then at some point it just dissipates and all the, everything just goes back to the earth. And like, that's kind of us with the, with this mysterious life force that we can't really fully put our um, finger on. Um, And so we, we, we as humans and all the other animals, any other life form is just kind of, appearing and disappearing out of the raw materials that are available and um and so if if whatever that mysterious life force that mysterious consciousness uh whatever that is the idea that it may travel from life to life and be drawn from some you know existing pond or soup of it you know and then we're getting a shard of it i mean again this is all very hard to talk about but it 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 does make sense to me on some level and maybe I'm not making any sense right now, so save me if I, if I need saving. Well, we're just muddling through it together. And again, this is where the vocabulary is uh, a hot mess. Um, it's, it's very hard, hard ideas to capture in rational English. It may be, may be easier in, in Hindi or <laughs> Nepali, uh, but English is tough. Um, and it's all conjecture. And you and I are both evidence-based folks. Uh, but I take comfort surely in the fact that you do the same things regardless <laughs> you know what i mean you 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 spend time meditating you are as you meditate you're led to i think inexorably into things like loving kindness meditation you become more compassionate that that is a word that 
it took me a while. But once you see the path to compassion as just integral to the path of insight, you can't unsee it. You, whether or not I feel like the consciousness within me is unified with the consciousness of my colleagues or of a homeless person, I feel it is the same. I feel we are the same in that sense. And that leads, again, inexorably to a compassion, very profound compassion, which makes you a better person. So I just have yet to come across any kind of pitfall <laughs> to entertaining this hypothesis of, of unity. And, and I see real benefits in terms of my lived experience and my conduct. As you may know, this show, 10% Happier, has a companion app where you can go and learn uh, how to put into practice all the great things you learn here on the show. As I like to think about it, it's, uh, it's like the in college, uh, the podcast is the lecture and the app is the lab where you can go and pound all of the wisdom from the show directly into your neurons. The app is also called 10% Happier. It's available wherever you get your apps. Go ahead and download it today. I want to steer us toward the practical for a second. If anybody's listening and is annoyed with the Harris brothers for, you know, thrashing around and attempting to grok the um, ineffable um, uh, or maybe just feeling like, well, how how do I even get a glimpse of this in my own practice? Let me just say a little bit. I, I'd be curious to hear what you're doing on the cushion that, that puts you in touch with the, you know, consciousness, awareness the observer. Um, I'll just say a little bit about the way Joseph Goldstein, who we're both students of and friends with, um, the great meditation teacher, Joseph, the way he instructs on this score. And I, I find this, I'm not sure everybody will find this pretty easy to understand and apply. Um, but I, personally, it's been very helpful for me. Um, is he'll he'll often point out uh, he'll often have people do a little exercise, which is like just move your arm. You don't have to do this, Matt, but just you know, if you move your arm, how much effort does it take to be aware of the sensations of the movement? None. It doesn't. It's effortless. And so that little word is the start of it for me. And I'll I'll walk you through the progression. Please, Matt, tell me if this makes sense. Once in a while, while I'm sitting in meditation. I will just drop in the word effortless. What kind of effort does it take for me to know whatever is happening in my mind right now? The sights, sounds, smells, sensations, thoughts? None. Okay. So then the next step for me is, and this is from Joseph, is to put it all into the passive tense. So this kind of takes the you out of it. Instead of saying, I'm knowing or I'm hearing, I'm thinking, no, thoughts are being known. Sensations are being known. Hearing is being known. And then this is the, the good stuff. By what? And, and what I often find is I can sense myself, usually the sensations center around like my face somewhere. So I get that sense. And then I can also sense the knowing of, you know, I can that I'm hearing stuff, thinking stuff, whatever, seeing stuff. But I can't connect the two. So I can't find whatever is knowing uh, all of my thoughts and other mental objects. And um, that, you know, as they say, the not finding is the finding. Um, that's the point. You don't have to go much deeper than that. You can just see this pretty obvious thing, which is that we're aware of stuff all the time. We just don't know what is is knowing all of it. Um, and you might even ask a supplemental question and then I'll shut up. Uh, so after you ask, known by what, who's asking this question? Right. So like, what is this ghostly inner narrator that's asking the question in the first place? Um, another thing you can't find. A a does any of that land for you, Matt? Yeah. And I, I have the benefit, you know, because of you, of, of some of Joseph's wisdom directly. But yes, that this move of going from the subject object to the passive voice, as I, I do, my ego still pipes up and says that my, our mother, the grammarian, would hate that. Uh, but <laughs> it is so powerful and is a, is a core part of my meditation practice of just 
thinking is happening, hearing is happening, it, removing the eye from it, which seems a little divisey, right? Because, you know, this Buddhist concept of no self. And so you make a grammatical move and have you really made progress? But it's profound. And just understanding that these things are happening and they're registered in awareness in removing the eye from it. Um, but it, it also, I, I think as a side note, like it is snowing makes no sense either. You know, we, we actually, there, there's something bigger that goes on in our grammar mm -hmm. where we, we cling to subjectivity. We, we want to believe that there's a doer behind things that are simply just happening. And mentally, of course, that is a really big problem. So I think that passive voice thing is very useful for me. Another move just tactically is you, you know, I experience meditation as quite frustrating to begin with. And that's a nearly universal experience from folks I talk to who are trying to do Vipassana or insight meditation. And, uh, I just laugh at myself. I'm much more playful now and just not gripping the situation it is having this relationship with my ego with its incredible efforts to intervene in the middle of my meditation it's amusing it has to be amusing and that has been really useful to avoid getting in these cycles of thinking and self-flagellation and wow this isn't working at all and and discouragement so if you can be playful about it and you can try to recognize the passive voice nature of the thoughts and the sounds and the sensations, um, th those have been two really important steps for me. And I'd say the final one, and again, you have had, you know, 15 years of this and I've had a year. So like I, please, uh, dear listener, take this as a, as the thoughts of an amateur, but the geography of the body as it relates to awareness, I, I've found really useful. I, I think this notion that all of the sense, most of the sense organs feed into the head combined with the sort of notion that that's where our brain is. I, I was coming to this thinking of my head, thinking of awareness being in my head right next to the thinking and it made it harder to separate them, frankly. And and so now I've I've practiced a long time thinking of awareness as more diffuse mm -hmm. through my body. And in particular, like in my gut, <laughs> I think about, I don't really think about it, but I, I experience awareness as emanating from my core, not emanating from receiving phenomena into my core and, and throughout the body. And that has been really useful for me as a, as a technique. You know, and, and the Tibetans, when you ask, when they talk about the mind, they point to the heart. Huh. So you're, seems to me like you're onto something there, but Let, let's just talk about the basic blocking and tackling of this pat of, of your practice over the past year. Like what, what how much are you doing uh, how much reading you're doing? Um, how have you, re you're, you're a dude with a very busy job and six children. Um, so how are you finding time for this? I'd love to know all of those like nitty gritty details. Yeah. You know, as you know, I put together a bibliography, uh, and, and try to put it kind of in order, um, in it and what will seem like pandering, but, but isn't, I do think <laughs> that 10% happier is a great on ramp. Um, and another really important book at the outset was Robert Wright's book, Why Buddhism is True, mainly to provide the intellectual scaffolding, uh, to sort of quiet the skeptic, uh, cause he writes in a, uh, you know, interesting, but sort of dry enough academic enough way to bring a lot of credibility to the topic. And then then I moved into some more heart-based stuff. Uh, so the reading agenda, you know, which by the way, continues apace. Um, I do find it really endlessly fascinating and it has a, 
it has a way of building on itself so that you can tackle more advanced material as you go. Um, meditating itself, you know, I started and I really highly recommend giving yourself permission to start with five minutes. It makes a big difference. I don't, I can't quantify how much difference five minutes of meditation makes, but it is an enormous building block to where you can get to, you can't skip straight or I couldn't skip straight to longer sits. And so the confidence that I built in the five minute sits combined with some of these techniques around the passive voice, around diffuse awareness, uh, the playfulness, all those were kind of built in these shorter sits and then stretch to 10. And, and now I really view that I get much more benefit out of a 20 minute um, meditation session than, than anything shorter and have gone as long as 45 minutes. And, and it really is a game changer. Uh, but as you note, you know, from my lifestyle perspective, you know, we, there's not a lot of quiet time in the house. I would say we, you know, we wake up early and, and we still have a four-year-old and two six-year-olds and, and, um, et cetera. So it's not the sort of thing where I can find even 20 minutes in the morning or I've failed to do so. So, um, you know, at my office, we have a, um, a wellness room and, and sometimes I'll use that if I can find, if I have a meeting cancel, sometimes I'll carve out 30 minutes and spend 20 of it meditating in the office. Uh, and my colleagues are very supportive of that. Um, but usually it's in the evenings. Hmm. It's usually after the little kids go to bed. So we're talking about seven thirty, eight o'clock, maybe even nine. Um, and I don't think if I had complete choice and no constraints, I would choose the evening because, you know, sleepiness is certainly a hindrance that shows up the later I get. Um, but I'd say 70, 80% of the time it's, it's in the evenings. You know, yesterday I flew out to California and, Airplanes are amazing for meditation. I will just say, like, I had this incredible sit on on the airplane. I was, I could have kept going, going, going. It was terrific. So there's a little bit of finding spots for it and not being afraid to experiment. Amen. That is great. I'm, it's, it, um, I'm, it's satisfying to hear you say these things because it's the, exactly the, the, what I would recommend to people, which is give yourself a break start really small, be super flexible, fit it into your life. Don't march forward with this idea of like what it should be, what it should look like, how long it should be. It's got to work with the conditions of, of your life. And if you can start really small, it will build. You'll find the time if it's findable. Um, and yeah, so amen. I mean, the other thing you mentioned in your, in, in your essay was that um, given that most days you don't have a ton of time. You've really been trying to do a lot of like off the cushion IRL, uh, free range, um, mindfulness. Can you say a little bit about, about that? Yeah. One of the early, really, really powerful moves early in the, in the chronology of the past 13 months for me was, um, I think mainly came from a guy, Shenzhen Young, uh, who writes very eloquently about the, that there's really no utility in thinking. And in fact, in his model, the more time you can spend without thinking, the more you, his, his word, purify your consciousness, awareness, and harnessing this idea of leaving aside what, what, what purification means, that there were actual benefits to not thinking. You just, that flies in the face of my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Where, I mean, even if I would acknowledge, and as I have for a decade plus, that the thoughts aren't me. I mean, the thoughts are my entire job and, and my entire life is having the right thoughts. And, and it would seem obvious that the more preparatory thoughts you had the better. These all build up to insightful and transcendent thinking. And, um, but that's not right. If you give yourself permission and even 
an imperative to think less. That's the off the cushion work that I found most meaningful. I just prioritize as much time as possible not thinking, just being aware of what's happening, catching thoughts arise, putting them to rest while I'm walking around. And not only was that not intuitive, but it a year and a half ago, I would have said it flies in the face of everything I'm trying to do, which is at work and even my family and my relationships, just trying to be thoughtful, trying to have planned. <laughs> and none of that was serving me. I still spend plenty of time thinking, like it or not. But moving from thinking being a priority and something you want to do as much of as possible to something where you want to do as little of it as possible, fully recognizing that you're going to still do a ton of it because that's the human condition. That was a big move for me. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing something quite wise there, which is emphasizing being mindful as much as possible off the cushion, which, by the way, I think actually the, <laughs> is a, a thing I actually, for, now that I've, I've been doing this for a minute, I, I sometimes forget to do. Um, so it's actually humbling and useful to hear your, your emphasis on it. Um, it's, so it sounds like you're you're endeavoring to be as mindful as possible during the course of your day. And and I was a little worried about this at the beginning when you talked about not thinking. And it doesn't sound like you're vilifying the thinking process or surprised or angry when thoughts, of course, come barging through the wall like the Kool-Aid man. That like that is that is the deal. I hear you pointing at that. Um, that to me seems like, again, I don't want to pretend that I know more than I do. You've been very good about expressing humility. I'm I'm not a trained meditation teacher, but to my ears, uh, that sounds like the right balance. Well, one thing I would just say to amend slightly or amplify what you said is, I don't consider it the same as being mindful. Uh, hmm. You know, when I meditate, there's an intensity the word most people that I've read is alertness. And so I will say when I meditate, it does feel like effort. I mean, there's an effortlessness to the way that awareness encounters phenomena, as you note. But mindful mindfulness meditation to me feels um, active. And I couldn't do that all day long. <laughs> I mean, it really would... Maybe I will someday, but what I'm talking about is um, more still than that, less alert. It's when I brush my teeth, I brush my teeth. You know, when I do the dishes, I just do the dishes and I just quiet my mind to the extent possible. But without that additional inflection of alertness, which I think is really important to my meditation practice, because that's where you catch thoughts early, where you really observe the entire out-breath or you observe the entire in-breath. Those are meditative techniques that I think move the ball forward. This is as much really about the absence of something. It's the absence of the uh, unconscious rumination that would fill my day for 50 years. And I would often you know, if I had to wash the dishes, I'm, I'm the dishwasher guy in our house a lot. And I'd put on an audio book, you know, yeah. like so uncomfortable being with my own thoughts, I guess, that I needed to find out what Jack Reacher was up to or whatever. <laughs> uh, and now I could just do the dishes. Okay. You put your finger on something pretty subtle there. And I again, want to make very clear something that you are aware of, but I just want to be very clear to the audience uh, the amount of training one needs to do, in my opinion, to be a proper, you know, Dharma teacher, meditation teacher who's gone through the Insight Meditation Society or Spirit Rock tr teacher training program. I mean, the, I'm married to a doctor. These people are doing as much, if not way more training in order to call themselves teachers. So I have so much respect for that. And I'm not that. Um, okay, so having said that, what I hear there touches on one of the biggest issues for meditators, uh, especially at the early stages, which is right effort. That's a Buddhist term of art. 
um, in Buddhism, there's the Noble Eightfold Path uh, that are, it's like a kind of a cookbook for how to get enlightened. And uh, each of the eight uh, um, uh, entries on the on the list of eight starts with the word right or proper or correct or wise, sort of like, uh, so right mindfulness, right view, right action, right speech. One of them is right effort. And meditation is extremely subtle and tricky in this regard. Uh, because on some level, the awareness of m- mental objects or phenomena, w- the awareness that of stuff that's flitting through your mind requires no effort. And yet meditation itself does require some effort, but probably not as much as we put in. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the, you know, the Buddha talked about it, like tuning the strings of a guitar. I actually, at that time, I don't think they had guitar. So he was talking about a lute, which is another stringed instrument. And it, it was about like, not too tight. If you, if your guitar strings are too tight, that it, that it sounds like shit. And if they're too loose, it sounds like shit. So it's, it's, it's a very tricky titration. And I'm wondering whether the absence of effort that you're feeling while you're washing the dishes is actually something that could be carefully ported over to the effortfulness of your daily meditation practice. Not to say that the daily meditation does not require some ardor, some intensity, but it might be less than you think. And there might be something instructive about these more easeful experiences of what I would definitely call mindfulness because you were dropping out of the stories in your mind and into the physical sense, the raw data of your physical sensations of washing the dishes or whatever else it is. So does any of that, does that that whole word salad make any sense to you? But Dan, I think what you're missing here is I'm really trying to win this. I'm really trying to crush (laughs) meditation. And I think this this laissez-faire attitude you have towards it misses the entire point. Uh, Yeah, no, it does resonate. I I think uh, titration is exactly right. And I don't, I have no illusion that I'm in exactly the right spot. And I think there is something to pour it back over. Uh, I do think of it as kind of chapters, you know, that uh, I'm not, trying to muscle it or grip it but I do there are techniques you know like paying careful attention to the breath uh, and noting techniques for instance as two examples that I've learned from Joseph that I don't do when I'm washing dishes that I do do on the cushion um, and so th- there are some distinctions but it may be that some somewhere in the middle is where I end up after, you know, more than just a, a year where some of those techniques become less like techniques and more natural mm-hmm. things that feel yes. quite, yes. Uh, you know, easeful and, and effortless. But right now they do feel like techniques. That all makes sense. Something Joseph often says after he drops like a real wisdom bomb, unlike my disorganized set of thoughts there is, you know, I'll look at him with an incomprehending look or feel, you know, like feeling put upon by having to operationalize some complicated thing he just dropped into my otherwise um, reasonably simple meditation. And he'll just say, play with it. And so I, I, I offer those words in the same spirit. Let me let me just go back to your essay. Um, it, it, uh, it struck me that there are two separate but related, although looked at from a certain light, perhaps maybe misunderstood as contradictory trajectories that you're on. On the one hand, you are very interested in understanding the impersonality of the ego and of whatever it is that's witnessing the ego. And on the other hand, you are also like digging into the specifics of your own ego. Like what what makes you tick? What are the patterns um, that have governed your life that uh, are helpful, unhelpful. Um, so you actually, I'll, I'll, I'll read you back to you. There's, there's one thing you said that um, caught my eye. You say, in my case, early experiences with shame and corporal punish and corporal punishment leave me feeling significant suffering when I cause disappointment in others. Uh, you comfortable talking a little bit about what, what you mean by that, both historically and presently? Yeah, and I would say, you know, I've uh, sort of committed not to editing that p- 
piece um, because it's really meant to be kind of an artifact of a year. But I would, at this point, change uh, disappointment to discomfort. Hmm. As I've thought more about, um, you know, my own makeup on that. And I, you know, the, I think, at least for my reading about sort of more pure Buddhist writings, which I would contrast with the Mark Epstein's and the Bruce Tift and the, there's a lot, as a rich vein that sit at the intersection of psychology, psychiatry, and, and Buddhism. But it kind of feels like the Buddhists would say like, Buddhism contains all you need to march down the path. My own experience is that it is useful to think about your own personal history and, you know, stuff uh, that you might have that's getting in the way. And, you know, some people call it shadow work. So yeah, I have dedicated time to that. Um, and it, it goes very nicely with meditation because you're, again, you're gaining these insights into the types of thoughts that are coming into your brain and it gives you some remove at which to contemplate your psychological makeup. So it's been a really, really useful tool. And yeah, specifically, I mean, you and I, you know, we grew up in a household, um, we had a caregiver, love her very much, but she was kind of old school in the way she thought about corporal punishment. And so it was a pretty big feature of our lives, you know, from a quite young age. And the paddle, the paddle, the wooden spatula. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Look, I mean, you and I have talked about this. We're not talking about big T trauma. You know, this is little boys get spanked. And yet, you know, for a two or three or four year old, you know, who knows, who knows when you capitalize the T, you know, it had, it was a big deal for me at that age. And so I think it's some degree of conjecture, but I see a through line between the intensity of that reaction and a strong desire that I observe in myself to really not want to cause people to be upset. And I think it's really gotten in the way of my career, my personal relationships, because it is, it gets in the way of candor and directness, hmm. which are duties you owe to your colleagues and to your, to the important people in your life. And not just duties, they, they bring all sorts of benefits, candor and directness. Because when you keep these thoughts inside and you, you fail to communicate them, you're really subtly at least withdrawing from that, from that counterparty. Um, whereas if you're quite direct, it's a form of connection in that. And so that has all been extremely useful to me because I don't... You know, I think of awareness and consciousness as impersonal. Unfortunately, the ego is, is well, I don't know if it's personal, but it's quite particular. <laughs> you know, it's, it's conditioned in a specific way uh, for people based on their lived experience. And mine is understanding the ways in which my ego has been conditioned, even as I'm defanging it through this distance and ability to observe. Um, understanding it deeply has been extremely gratifying and useful. And I've seen very strong benefits in how I show up just simply by understanding, oh, well, this would be a time when I would couch some feedback or I would retreat or avoid this conversation. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I understand that conditioning, but I, have the agency to do what feels right. And what feels right is to be more candid and, and uh, forthright. So that's a, a good example, I think, of why some of this personal history and shadow work, uh, this more psychological work, it, it can be a quite good companion to the mindfulness work. Yeah, I mean, I agree a million percent. And it really comes down to a concept that, for me at least, it comes down to a concept that gets talked about a lot in Buddhist circles, and you mentioned it in in your writing that the there are two things that are true simultaneously all the time uh, but it is true that you are matt and y- i'm dan i'm your brother we grew up together and uh you you know you need to move through the world as matt and i need to move through the world as dan i mean we in the term of art in buddhist circles for this is 
relative reality, you know, your consensual reality. We're all living in the same movie. We, we agree that this is this is all true as far as it goes. And then there's ultimate reality. And and one rough analogy for this is like if you think about a chair on, on the relative or consensual level, like it's a chair. You could sit in it. On the ultimate level, if you were to take a high-powered microscope, you would see that it's mostly empty space spinning subatomic particles. Um, and so they're both true. You can still sit in the chair and it's, you know, uh, a mysterious amalgamation of atoms and uh, even smaller particles. And uh, there's no essence to the chair to be found. Um, and so if you think about it in, in your life, yeah, it's true that the ego is impersonal and whatever knows the ego, you know, inside of you is also unfindable and impersonal as well and mysterious. That, that's all true on an ultimate level, but on a relative level, like you you do have your patterns injected into you by your parents, your caregivers, the culture, your frat brothers, whatever it is. Um, not that you were in a fraternity, but yeah, you know what I'm saying, like the larger culture. Um, and there is a fruitful conversation to be had between these two levels. So you can do th shadow work or therapy or whatever. And it's really useful to understand that these patterns are impersonal <laughs> um, uh, and you don't have to take them as seriously. Anyway, does that all track with what you were trying to point to? Yeah. And I think the, I'm sure given again, the venerable lineage of, of the Buddhist only approach that you don't need to do it. But uh, surely what I found was that it made meditation easier and, mm -hmm. and more appealing when I was also, you know, thinking about my personal history. So it, it was very reinforcing and it helped me to make progress, I think more quickly. So as somebody who'd never been and has never been in, in therapy or, or, you know, which I view as a categoric mistake at this point, but, you know, I, I came to it pretty cold and, um, and as a result, I, I had an awful lot to learn. Yeah. Well, I, I doesn't matter what came before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, uh, the Lord's work now, the Lord that our parents and we don't believe in, um, so I'm curious, like, where has all this left you? You, I mean, th th there's a world in which this kind of exploration could be pretty deeply destabilizing. You have the 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 structure of your life is you know pretty firm, and there are a lot of people who are looking to you, your your colleagues, your staffers, your family. Um, so where? Where are you with all of this now? What are the you you, you end the the essay with some open questions? Can you talk a little bit about what those are? Yeah, the well, it's it's very useful to have this concept in mind of of the two layers, the relative and the absolute. On the absolute level, you know, what my investment returns look like isn't that important. <laughs> You know, I, and I, I'm connected to that absolute level and it makes a lot of the things I do every day seem less important at that level. And yet I, not only have I not, but I, I really have no desire or intention of relinquishing this relative level wherein my investment returns are extremely important and my investment returns have real beneficiaries, you know, hospitals and, and college endowments and, and pensioners. And so too, my commitments to being uh, as good a father as I can possibly be and as good a husband as I can possibly be, well, maybe not uh, important on the absolute level where we're all, uh, you know, puffs of energy. Uh, they still are commitments that I embrace no less than I did a year ago and much more skillfully than I did a year ago. I feel that I'm much better at those relative level commitments, having had, you know, some level of early insight uh, as we've been discussing. So, you know, you mentioned the Eightfold Path. Of course, one of those is right livelihood. 
And I could certainly imagine going through this exploration, coming to the conclusion that even on the relative plane, you know, I didn't have the right livelihood and I had to make a change. I, that has not been the case so far. My, you know, my day job, I'm an investor at a venture capital firm. And that involves making lots of judgment calls. Um, but mostly what I do is try to help companies be successful. Mostly what I do is I sit with groups of people and I try to get, you know, do my small part to get them collectively moving in the right direction and make sure the relationships between and among them are are healthy, both in our partnership and our team and in and, and the companies I work with. And that's just all very, very consistent with the kind of motivations that I even retain on the absolute level around loving kindness and compassion. Um, so I'd say so far so good. You know, I do think you're right to flag some level of maybe risk is too strong, but let's use that word. You know, there are people who go through the dark night of the soul who as their identity is becoming less concrete, really have a crisis around, well, what's left and who am I? And, and that, that can be really scary for folks. And I am mindful of that. And then of course you might discover upon connecting with some new values that the choices you've been making uh, are no longer what feels true. And I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, I think hopefully not totally coincidentally, I chose a line of work that's pretty aligned with my values. And that's left me feeling pretty good about where I sit. I seem to remember, Dan, you used to work in broadcast television and now you don't. So I don't know if you have any comments about right livelihood from your experience. I actually, I had no question really. I, I didn't, uh, I don't want to say no question about the ethics of television news for sure. There, there were things that um, I didn't like, but largely I felt journalism was an, a pretty noble pursuit with its flaws for sure. Structural flaws and obviously individual flaws that I and others were bringing to the table. So I'm not saying it's some like, I don't want to overstate this, but I, I didn't leave network news because I had ethical problems with with uh, the industry. I left it because I loved it and left it reluctantly because I had, because I realized that trying to do two things at once was making me miserable and by extension, everybody around me. Um, yeah. yeah, I will say just to embarrass you that, you know, so many, so many people have said to me behind your back, that, like you're this, an unusually menschy venture capitalist. So, um, <laughs> everything you just said about wanting to help companies survive, um, that, that, that just rings true to me. There is a part of journalism and actually oddly a part of venture capital, which is hugely egoic. You, know, oh, you yeah. really have yes. to, you know, build a, a brand. And I would say that's gotten harder. You know, I used huh. to be active on Twitter and it, it it's very hard for me to like get motivated to be active on Twitter. It doesn't feel authentic. It feels highly egoic. And um, I'm much more interested in content like what we're talking about here. If, you know, this is why I think it's non-egoic for you to be on Twitter because you're really bringing the good word about something incredibly important to lots of people. That same is not exactly true in, in, my, in my business life. And so I think that if there's been a, a change um, in terms of how I work, it's been a little bit more focused on relationships and on these new to me concepts of candor and transparency and forthrightness and directness and a little bit less on kind of personal brand building. Let me gently correct you. Not, not that you said anything, you know, like dharmically or factually, well, slightly factually incorrect as it pertains to my inner life. I can assure you that my Twitter and other social media are not empty of ego. Um, <laughs> delusion which you can translate into the lack of seeing of whatever's whatever's happening right now. Delusion is slippery and insidious. And um, what I would say that is more accurate is there's less ego in my public branding now than there used to be. 
Not that there's no ego. For sure, do I look at like how my posts are doing? Yeah, I do. And to an embarrassing extent, yes. So I did want to be completely upfront about that. But but it does it feel less ego fueled than what I used to do? Absolutely. And do I do I have much more confidence that what I'm putting out into the world is like often unassailably helpful? Yeah, because it's that's actually where the ego has gone way down because the stuff I'm putting out isn't my ideas in the first place. I'm just taking ancient ideas and putting a little bit of a spin on it. So I don't actually feel that much authorship over it anyway. Um, And so I actually think there's a way in which, and I root for this, you may just have a different brand going forward. And there may be things pushing you to Twitter or or Medium or other Uh, platform for for self-expression that feels authentic rather than talking about market dynamics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I welcome that. Um, All right, just one one last just personal question. You you, you talk also about seeing fear in your mind that surprised you. Um, I'd just be interested to hear any thoughts about that. Like, I guess I would not have hitherto described you as a guy who seemed that anxious. back to the fact that I never really thought you, you know, of all people, you know, desperately needed meditation. Uh, And yet you describe in your practice seeing, you know, no small measure of fear. Yeah, I think this is, you know, as I mentioned with this idea of the dark night of the soul, which is, I think, a term of art in, uh, in, in the mindfulness circles. um, When you open up this Pandora's box, I think you're going to find good stuff and bad stuff. So I think I was very good at disassociating, which is not to say the fear wasn't present, but I really wasn't giving it any attention or oxygen, which I don't think is healthy. Um, but when you when you do get curious about the workings of your mind, you're going to find some stuff that is unpleasant. And so, yeah, I do... I wouldn't still, I wouldn't describe myself as anxious, but I could now tell you what anxiety feels like. I have seen it, Uh, you know, just being on an airplane this week, there are moments where I can connect with the anxiety that comes from the improbability of being 38,000 feet in the sky, trapped in a tube. And it's very interesting to see that anxiety and then back up and see it in the context of a spacious consciousness where the anxiety is there, but it's not everything. It's a cloud in the sky. It's not your whole worldview. And it doesn't go away, at least not quickly. But I can treat with it as a, as a part of me, um, a part that historically I think been quite I had been quite disassociated from, and now I can't really avoid because I'm spelunking around in my brain all the time. (laughs) Um, But yet, thankfully, you also get given these tools uh, to where you don't have to attach to it and identify with it. So yeah, I have a new relationship with anxiety, uh, and it's more palpable than it had been historically. And I don't, I don't want, I don't wish that were true. It is, I mean, anxiety is a, I don't have to tell you this, it is a really terrible feeling. I assume Mm. our listeners are acquainted with it as well. I mean, it really, really feels like it could tilt you out of control. And so dancing with that, um, again, I wouldn't, wouldn't wish for it, but I think it's part of the gig of, of opening up this, you know, this clockwork and, and seeing how, what makes it tick. Life is the dancer. Um, <laughs> I, I life you know, is I the mean, dance, Dan. I mean, come on, you're the <laughs> dancer. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Can't, Can't even get, get your saccharine right. aphorisms right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of podcast host are you? <laughs> uh, just to, just to, hang a lantern on what you just said i i I, this is very common living a more examined life going from pamphlet to novel or whatever has its downsides the 
heretofore unseen and uncomfortable aspects of your mental makeup will become more salient. And that's uncomfortable. And then the good news is that that the whole past should be just replete with tools for handling in a more supple and sophisticated way the stuff that was there anyway and driving you blindly. So that 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 just sounds, from what I know, like progress on the path. So back back for one second on this topic of fear, Joseph uh, has this incredible line that you and I have both heard, which I was using this week as I sat on that airplane. That I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the anecdote, but he also struggled with fear when he's in his meditation practice for years. That was really problematic, and eventually he came to a place where he said, "If this fear never leaves me, that's okay." In effect, I, I can live with that. I can accommodate it. I can hold it. And lo and behold, the fear started to dissipate. And this is another, you know, I, I mentioned playfulness. Um, this is another takeaway here is that um, the resistance is the problem. You know, I say that with great confidence, still screwing it up all over the place. <laughs> But I just keep learning over and over again that it's that resistance to the anxiety that is causing it to feel so real. And if like Joseph, you can just acknowledge it and understand physically as you scan your body, can I, can I live with this? You can actually, you can live with it. And that has a way of really defanging it. Well said. And, and he, you know, for anybody interested in like operationalizing this in your own life, the little phrase that you can drop into your head when you're experiencing something uncomfortable is it's okay. Meaning not that everything is right with the world, but it's okay to feel this. You can handle it. No defibrillator required. Like you can handle this uncomfortable sensation. And I find that to be extremely empowering. Um, all right, so I just want to, as we veer toward the end of our time together, um, just to read you a little bit more from the essay. Here's the quote. In the end, the most pressing question I'm wrestling with after year one is trying to figure out what consciousness wants of me. I sense it wants me to be more full. I sense it wants me to more fully embrace this sense of being connected versus separate. Consciousness wants me to live more and more in a sense of ease and peace instead of conflict and suffering. This past summer, I had an ecstatic experience riding my, bar riding my bike on Martha's Vineyard and had an insight that consciousness wants to use my body and my life as a vehicle to enjoy as many peak experiences as possible. Above all, consciousness wants me to serve, not out of a pathological need to please, but rather as a compassionate urge to reduce human suffering. I... I I, I I love all of that. And also it's just, you know, if I were to rewind it back to 18 months ago, it's, a, it's extraordinary that those words are coming out of your keyboard. Um, yeah, I think how I feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I mean, those, I, I, I just wonder if there's, having read those words back to you, if there are any, any aspects of it you want to expand upon now? Well, I want to go back to the, conversation we had about what's evidence-based and what isn't uh you know i stand by the framing because it feels exactly right to me this question of what would what does consciousness want of us it feels entirely authentic like actually my lived experience that i am setting about to do what feels true and right and perhaps the most valid test of that is what would consciousness want? What does this awake and aware part of me want to do? And I don't know if that implies the kind of spiritual connectivity and unity that you and I were describing, but I do know this, it's a really useful test to live a better life. So it's a little bit Pascal's wager, you know, maybe there is no unity, maybe there is no God, but it sure as hell makes sense to live as though there is. At least that's what I've discovered. So when when you say, what does consciousness want of me? It's like, 
there's there's some perhaps non-local uh, universal unified aspect of you but but even if it, even setting aside the metaphysics we can just say there is definitely s- some wise part of you that is awake and aware as you said what does yeah, that version of you want from right. you is that's the question some unconditioned part of me some part of me that is not subject to my personal history and my quirks and mm. all the thoughts, egoic thoughts that beset me. There's something in me that is removed from those things that has that vantage point. And yes, the wisdom that comes with that vantage point. And if I can access that as I make decisions, I will make better decisions, much higher integrity, more authentic decisions. And I've already seen that. Um, And I, I am certain, however long the second half of my life is it'll be much richer for having that as a guiding principle. Well, I hope it's long, selfishly. Um, <laughs> the uh, will you humor me if I just say a few words in the in the, in the closing moments here? Yeah, totally. Uh, okay, so first thing to say is kind of a joke. Um, Matt and I were on a, a small private a little meditation retreat that I helped organize that Matt and I co-organized um, with Joseph a, a few months ago. And I made this joke at the end that I, it was just so cool to be looking around the room and seeing my brother who, while very supportive of all my various endeavors was not, you know, in the, in the weeds on them, you know, not, not, you know, arm in arm marching forward toward Nirvana with me. Um, it was so cool to be looking around the room and seeing him doing sitting meditation, walking meditation, asking really smart questions. And I, I said at one point in my own meditation, this statement of the Dharma emerged that I believe was in one of the middle length discourses from the Buddha. And the statement was, I fucking told you. Uh, <laughs> So that's that's the joke. I'll say to you publicly what I've said to you privately, which is even if you weren't my brother, I would want to be hanging out with you all the time. I think you're incredible. But on top of that, you're my brother. So I say and I say this with no I I do not feel uh, like I I, no part of me is like I feel like I told you so. I say this with only um, true delight, a lot of it very selfish delight that I am incredibly proud of you. And and it's just it's just cool to be doing this with you instead of near you. Uh, so, yeah, th- thank you for for come for all everything you've done, but specifically for coming on uh, the show and talking about it. It's not easy. So thank you. Well, there's no way I'd be where I am today without your leadership and perseverance and patience with me. So, and it really has been transformative. So I'm grateful to you for so many things, but not least carrying forward the lantern on this path and showing me the way. So thank you. 